Pacific Cali, huh? I'm Phil Pycott. This is my buddy, canine buddy, Callie Pycott. We're here at the Roger Williams Zoo Park in Providence, Rhode Island. We just finished looking at a wonderful exhibit of all the wonderful animals here, and um, we want to give you a little view of Australia Zoo next. So uh, sit back and check it out. In order to get to Australia Zoo, I traveled halfway around the world, over 10,000 miles crossing over both the international date line and the equator to arrive in the beautiful country of Australia otherwise known as Oz. While traveling such a far and distant journey, while still having your sanity when you finally arrive, it's best at all possible to fly in first class. Thanks to my friends at United Airlines, my travel to the Southern Hemisphere could not have been any better. First class. Alright sir, thank you. Thank you. United Airlines offers daily non-stop trans-Pacific service to Sydney, Australia via Los Angeles and San Francisco. My 23-hour journey originating from the east coast of the United States departed late afternoon and arrived in Australia early in the morning one day later. Yes, by crossing over the international date line, I lost one entire day which I would easily make up with all the fun I was expected to have down under. On this particular flight, there were four flight attendants servicing the entire first class section, with only four passengers on board. Wow, now that's what I call great service. Please wake me up when we finally get there. Yay, I finally made it back on land. Hello, Australia. From Sydney, I hopped onto a short one-hour domestic flight to the city of Brisbane, or what the locals refer to as Brizzy. Brisbane is located in the Northern Territory state of Queensland. From Brisbane, I would begin my one-hour and 15-minute land trek to Australia Zoo, located in the town of Biwa on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland, Australia. Comfortable and reliable tour bus service to Australia Zoo runs on a routine daily schedule and services passengers directly to and from many of the hotels within the Brisbane city limits and the Gold Coast Resort area. However, for the more adventurous traveler who wants to venture the outback on their own, while always remembering to drive on the left-hand side of the road, rental cars are available for the day. Australia Zoo is a short one hour and 15 minute drive north of Brisbane along the Bruce Highway, route number one. 
Along the way, you'll pass by the very majestic Glasshouse Mountain National Park. So eventually, you'll merge onto Steve Irwin Way. Yes, Steve Irwin actually has a highway named in his honor. They changed it to Steve Irwin Way, which we're about to turn on to now. Previously, Glasshouse Mountain's tourist drive. But they also commissioned an artist to do a bit of a, uh, you know, a memorial, mark, whatever. Um, and it acts as a street sign and as a memorial to Steve Irwin. So, of course, the classic Steve Irwin pose, you know, the crocodile jumping up and holding out a bit of food for him. So we'll pull up here and uh, you can hop on out and uh, get a picky in front of it and, uh, and all that kind of stuff if you like, all right? And if you do want to take a picky of the coach, a lot of people tend to want to do that, uh, take the driver's side, uh, you get better light on it and uh, all that kind of stuff. And uh, that's got all the pictures on it too on this uh, driver's side. So there you go, I'll be out and have a bit of a look here folks, it only takes us a couple of minutes and... Finally, we've arrived at Australia Zoo. Situated at the main entrance of Australia Zoo is a bronze statue in honor of Steve Irwin and his entire family. Wife Terry, his daughter Bendy, his son Robert, and of course his beloved dog Suey. What is unique of the statue is that the entire Irwin family is depicted holding up a saltwater crocodile. In memory of the sudden and tragic passing of Steve Irwin, his legacy and passion for wildlife conservation continues to live strongly here at Australia Zoo. As a way to commemorate Steve's life on a worldwide scale, the Irwin family has established Steve Irwin Day, which takes place every November 15th. This special day is recognized by people wearing khaki shirts as a way of symbolizing the very same type of outfit that Steve used to wear. Australia Zoo has set up a khaki shirt memorial exhibit in which fans and celebrities from all over the world have personally autographed their names and best wishes for continued wildlife conservation in Steve Irwin's memory. Australia Zoo is comprised of 76 acres and is located in the rural landscape of Biwa, Australia, on the Sunshine Coast of Queensland. Australia Zoo was originally named the Biwa Reptile Park and was founded in 1970 by Steve Irwin's parents, Bob and Lynn Irwin. In 1982, the park was renamed to Queensland Reptile and Funna Park. In 1990, Steve and Terry took over the business operations and renamed the park Australia Zoo. Today, Australia Zoo is world-renowned due in part to the Animal Planet Television Network's highly popular program, The Crocodile Hunter. Australia Zoo serves as a leading wildlife expert when it comes to all animals and reptiles indigenous to Australia. Come with me. Share with me. Share my wildlife with me. Because humans want to save things that they love. My job, my mission, the reason I've been put on this planet is to save wildlife. Helping to preserve the legacy of Steve Irwin's crusade for wildlife conservation at Australia Zoo is Ms. Kirby Orr, Senior Media Director who introduced me to Mr. Josh Ruffles, Curator of Reptiles. I had the distinct pleasure of meeting with Josh who gave me a rare behind the scenes insight of Australia Zoo and some of the zoo's largest and most ferocious residents. I'm here with Josh uh, Ruffle, who's the curator of reptiles for Australia Zoo. I want to thank Josh so much for uh, giving us a few minutes of your time to demonstrate a, a little bit about what you do here in Australia Zoo and why Australia Zoo is so important to you and why people from around the world should come to visit Australia Zoo. Well, I think um, just sort of what my job entails is looking after all the reptiles here at the zoo. So the crocs and snakes and lizards sort of encompasses the whole thing and um, over seeing the department. Now obviously Australia Zoo is one of the leading um, uh, facilities in the world as far as um, to deal with crocodiles and reptiles in general so it's an awesome place to come and visit because of that fact and you get to see crocodiles do things that you see sort of nowhere else in the world as well. Um, and it's just, just, just basically obviously we're very much into conservation and this opportunity sort of afforded to people who work here at the zoo like nowhere else in the world so it's just a great place to work. 
I saw your demonstration a few minutes ago uh, with Monty. Yep. Uh, now, how many alligators, or excuse me, crocodiles, saltwater crocodiles, do you have here at the Zoo? Well, we have we have 30 plus saltwater crocodiles here at the zoo. We have um, seven crocodiles out the back of the crocodile here that we use on a daily basis for our uh, demonstrations in the crocodile. So we have seven large male crocodiles that we use for that. Now, the question I had for Kirby, who's holding our camera, by the way, thank you so much. <laughs> How do you tell the difference from one croc to another? Oh, I mean, they, because they don't wear a same bag. No, no, they, but you know, you sort of think like a lot of people, like you see one croc, you see them all, but really, if you if you really take a close look at them, they, they are all distinctly different, have slightly different features, so they're very much like humans, you know, we all have different uh, different features, and, and if you get to know the certain animals, you can, it's very easy to tell them apart, it's like night and day. Now, do you know that if they're having a bad day or not? Oh, we do, like obviously with any of with any animals, you pick up on behavioral issues or, um, uh, you know, different things on, on the day, different precursors to different behaviors and, and what have you. So you can sort of pick up on things. Um, you know, crocodiles are a lot more intelligent than people actually give them credit for. That's what uh, Steve Irwin had mentioned. Yeah, 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 and they, they really are. They have, you know, obviously have the ability to learn and remember, so um, you know, they do, they do um, obviously look at our patterns, our daily routines, how we do things, and you've always got to be on your toes. Um, because you, you, know, you never know. And you mentioned something in your uh, show from uh, standing at least five meters away from any type of water. Yeah. Um, and, and that's obviously like when you're up in, in any crocodile territory, sort of worldwide, um, that sort of keeps you out of the strike range of, of even the, the largest saltwater crocs. So, um, uh, you know, the water's edge are obviously very dangerous in the water and sometimes above the water, depending on the area, you know, overhand hanging limbs and branches and, and that sort of thing. So if you stay back that distance from the water, um, you should be safe from, from uh, encountering any crocodiles. Right. So how long does it take to train salt? Oh, it, it you know, from, from the time you pull it out of the yeah. wild to you know, introducing it to its new home that it's really a zoo. Um, yeah, it depends. It totally depends on the animal. Um, sometimes we have animals that, that sort of adapt to um, um, life in captivity very well. Other times you have they take a little bit longer. Um, so it can take anywhere from several months to you know, even up to a couple of years. Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that because uh, I have a dog back home. Her name is Callie. Six-year-old Boston Terrier. Now that dog is smarter than a cat. Uh, from an operating condition standpoint, yeah. you know, Skinner box, yeah. you're in the bill. Yeah. Do they respond to that? And they do, and, and they, they, it's exactly right. So you know, as noticed during the during the demonstration, we use white buckets, yeah. and they, they they definitely all across the, around the zoo associate that white bucket with food because they always know that's a food bucket. So whenever they see that white bucket, they sort of flew in on that and go, you know, there's potentially food involved with, with what we're doing. The same thing like a dog with um with treats or what have you, or certain activities, they they start that you know Sounds salivating and the whole thing. So same sort of thing. Right. Yeah. Well, in terms of uh, what kind of message would you want to convey to folks back uh, here in the states where I'm from, uh, the Boston, Massachusetts, Providence, Rhode Island area? Yeah. Uh, what would really get them to come down here? Oh, uh, I, I think there's a, there's a number of things. There's obviously this part of the world. There's such a diversity of wildlife here. It's such a beautiful area. And like I said, there's um, to see things here in Australia is that, you're, that you really can't see anywhere else in the world. And, and our conservation message, like I said, is so strong. And as well as just the diversity of animals we have here and really getting to know animals like the saltwater crocodile. And that was a massive part of Steve's message and um, passing on to all of us. So um, it's, it's just, just a beautiful place to come and visit. Thank the zoo itself and the area. Okay. One day I said, did you have an, have an opportunity to work with uh, Steve Irwin? I did. And um, it, just a, a couple times uh, I had the opportunity to work with him back in the United States, and, um, and yeah, he was an amazing guy, great, great guy to work with. I want to thank you again, Josh, for a wonderful time. This is Australia Zoo. For anyone who would like to uh, visit, they're on the web. Check them out. This next segment of my visit to Australia Zoo, I took a tour of the Animal Planet Crocosium Arena, where I was asked to assist in the training of a red-tailed black cockatoo. The goal of this training exercise was to coax this very intelligent bird to swoop down from the sky and to take a $5 bill from my hand and fly away, while eventually flying back to return my $5. Well, as you're about to find out, my job as a guest animal trainer for Australia Zoo didn't turn out too well. Check this out. We're here in Australia Zoo at the Crocosium. We're going to be doing a live demonstration of a, what, a red... Red-tailed black hawk. red-tailed black hawk. 
So, wish me luck. <laughs> Okay. So do you go up? Hey. You lie. You lie. Okay. Let's stand up again. Right. Yep. Hold your hold your arm up with your your note. That's it. So just leave that hand down, that's it. And then give the I'll try and call them up to you lie. You lie. Come on, buddy. Come on. You lie. Come on. You lie. It's really tense. <laughs> mm -hmm, good. I have the same problem with my dog. You lie, come on. Right. Looks like he's going to be a little bit nervous today. Come on. Come on. Well, after several attempts to bribe Eli, the red-tailed black cockatoo, who performed several tricks for us for only $5, he immediately flew the coop on insisting that he simply had enough. I'm meeting with Eli's agent regarding his performance contract, and his new salary increase beyond the five dollars that we originally offered him. This bird showed us just how smart and negotiable he truly is. Yeah, some neat stuff there. Next, I had an opportunity to visit the Australia Zoo Rescue Unit, an all-purpose veterinary hospital intended for the exclusive care of Australia Zoo's animals and all other wild native animals indigenous to Australia. This was one of Steve Irwin's dream come true accomplishments to have established, with the help from the Wildlife Warriors Group, a self-funded, leading state-of-the-art medical facility that in many ways mimics the high degree in care and compassion found in most human hospitals. My tour guide for the day was Miss Sarah Mann, who gave me a behind-the-scenes view of Australian Zoo's hospital and some of its patients. We can go in here to get their body temperatures back up. Um, we can also put baby koalas in here, little baby possums, um, little kangaroo joeys. You can see the little pouches that we've got made up for them down there. So they can sit there. Oh, is there a joey in here at the moment? There you go. He wasn't in there about 15 minutes ago, so it's always changing. The equipment on the right hand side of the wall has actually all been donated by human hospitals, so we can still use that equipment um, for the animals. And the teddies up the back there have been donated by kids just like you, and we give those to the orphaned koala joeys. So the little baby baby koalas that don't have mum anymore, we give them those and they can snuggle up and feel a little bit more comfortable. So yeah, every little every joey gets a teddy. Occasionally the hospital will receive a sick or injured koala bear or baby kangaroo, otherwise known as a joey, from people who come across them as a result of them falling from a tree being hit by an automobile, or sustaining an unidentified injury or illness which incapacitates the animal to where it can no longer fend for itself. During the admittance process to the Australia Zoo Hospital, the human rescuer is given the opportunity to name the animal that they have rescued. From that point forward, the animal is tagged and will receive free of charge medical treatment to get them back to good health. This particular patient is a koala bear who was brought into Australia Zoo Hospital as he was found to be suffering from something unknown. In order to properly diagnose the exact source of the problem, it was necessary for the medical staff to sedate him for a more thorough examination, which would include x-rays, a urinalysis, blood chemistry test, a weigh-in, and of course a good dental cleaning. Feeling a bit dizzy when she climbs up the tree, huh? So I see koalas every day, but I never would have thought, oh, that one's got an ear infection. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Sometimes they're also brought in for other reasons, and then when we check and them over, we them. find yeah. um, more problems with them. But this is this is an amazing room. Yeah. Um, in the old hospital, we all had to leave the room whenever they were taking X-rays because it was so small and cramped. 
Um, we've got this big lead line door here now, so we can just close the door and do it all here. Um, we've got anaesthetic fitted out on this table, so we can see while it is um, under anaesthetic at the moment. Um, so it keeps it nice and calm, especially if we have to take multiple x-rays. Um, yes, <laughs> We're not like looking at you anyway. They're all wild koalas. Um, and the digital imaging equipment in the back room there was donated by Fujifilm. And it means that we don't need to have a light board and we don't need any of the chemicals in the need to print the x-rays out and see it straight away, which is really good. Sorry. <laughs> don't mean to be distracting. That's okay. We're in a hospital. Um, down the hall. So we've got around 80 koalas in here at the moment. Um, this is one of our koalas from the intensive care unit. Um, just getting a bit of sunshine and brought out into the nice fresh air. <laughs> and what's wrong with this one here? Oh, he has pelvic injuries. Oh, okay. Yeah, yep, hit my car. There are lots of koalas brought in hit by cars. Um, especially now, we're, we're heading into breeding season, so a lot of the male koalas are out on the move trying to find breeding parts. Um, but most of them are kept in these, these um, enclosures up the back here. So there's four big enclosures. Um, the ones that you can see on the right hand side are for all of the internal trauma injury koalas. So all of those ones that have been hit by cars, attacked by dogs, um, have broken bones. They can stay in there for up to eight months. Um, while their wounds heal and they learn how to climb again and that kind of thing. On the left hand side it's all the koalas that have contagious diseases. Um, so chlamydia, cystitis, conjunctivitis, that kind of thing. We would like to keep them really... Chlamydia for koalas. Yes, chlamydia for koalas. Um, it's, it, it's thought to have um, been brought to Australia with the introduction of sheep. So um, it's not human chlamydia, it's, it's an animal strain, but yeah that's where it originally came from. So um, they go in, in those wards, um, separate from the cleaner koalas. Um, we don't want any crossover of diseases. And they go on a 28-day course of antibiotics until they're all cleared up yeah. and brought back into the wild. <laughs> from the intensive care unit of Australia Zoo Hospital, I visited the rainforest, a recuperative sanctuary for wild koala bears who are not yet ready to return home to the I wild. Think we should all be able to fit in in one go. <laughs> Mm. Oh boy. So we've got eight little girls in here at the moment. They're all just over one year old. Um, and they'll stay with us until they're about four kilos, which is where we think they're, which is why we have the tours on at this time. It's very cute. So we've tried to make this enclosure as lifelike as possible so that they can learn the skills that they need. We can't actually touch them as much as I wish I could give you a hug. Um, we can't touch these girls because because we want them to learn that humans are bad. So when they go back into the wild, they'll stay away from people because they need to learn how to survive. So that's why we can't touch them. Um, even though I know they're very cute, aren't they? Just want to go, ooh, <laughs> I need to hug you. But we can't, but they are awake, which is very cool. So you can see them moving around. Because usually I come in here and they're all sleeping right up the top. So. So they, all they eat is gum leaf, these leaves here. Um, that's how they get around. <laughs> they jump from tree to tree. They don't like coming to the ground because that's where the dangers are, the cars and the dogs. Yeah. Well, I want to thank everyone for looking at the virtual tour of Australia Zoo. I want to thank a lot of special people for making this video production happen. Josh Ruffel, the curator of reptiles for Australia Zoo, and Kirby Orr, the media director for Australia Zoo. For my canine buddy Callie, I'm Phil Pikeye. We want to thank everyone for watching. Have a great day. Good day, mate. Oh,